idea behind microservices and how they have, have come into existence. One of the things that is a very important part of microservices is uh, DevOps. And um, there's DevOps and then there's microservices. And it's kind of hard to completely get rid of one or the other. And in, in terms of DevOps, here we go, here's an example. The idea is that you have a culture uh, that wants to make fast changes. You also have uh, automation built in so that you're, you're, you're delivering your code uh, at a regular interval. You're using infrastructure automation like, let's say, IAC. And then additionally, uh, you're able to make sure that your code is always in a highly testable state and you're using things like agile planning so you have you know tickets and uh, other resources to to do planning where you have incremental releases so we'll call this small small changes and, and this really enables microservices and then once you start building microservices really it it goes into the concept of a function in in Python and this function or in some other language and this function can map to many different things it can map to an event it could also map to a command line tool it could also map to uh, let's say a web service a HTTPS web service and in order to to build one of these microservices it's really about the the chain of i have a function we'll call this here's my function and it has an input that goes in and then i do something so this is my processing and then after my processing it, it returns something and let's talk a little bit how this process works in 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 something that you probably have some familiarity with and a good example of this would be the garage door opener in your house so if we go and we look at a build a garage here maybe a couple car garage we have a door another door and we'll just make it maybe make this a house of some kind Inside of this garage door, typically you'll have a light that, that turns on. And so we'll, we'll call this the garage. And if you notice this light, uh, and, and we'll, maybe we'll draw, draw a little light bulb like this. Th this light bulb, how can it actually turn on? Well, one way that it, the, the light bulb can turn on is that the garage door opens. So open the door. So why would it do that? Well, it's, it's triggered, right? So this is, a, this is basically an event. Uh, and this event says, open the door and the event would then go turn on light. And, and functions in the cloud are very similar. So these, these Lambda functions, or these Google Cloud functions work in an almost identical way is you hook the logic here, or in, the, in this case, it's, it's the light, um, is just waiting for somebody to do something or turn on the light in some way. In this case, we can hook it up to the garage door opening. The second way though, is that, we'll, we'll say open the door, we'll just leave it. The, the second way is you can flip on the switch. So you can manually trigger it and that light will turn on. But there could be even a third type of way that you turn on the light. A lot of people will have a timer. And in the case of a timer, uh, maybe at, at uh, let's say midnight, the, the light will 
we'll go through and, and turn on it. So you can see how this this is really a you have you have some logic, and this logic has many different ways of of being reused. The, and this is the event. This is manually, and then also a timer. And this is really the core concept of microservices is the little pieces of, of useful code and you, you can hook those up to, to do whatever it is you need to do. And, and one of the things that I'll show today is uh, a, a AWS workflow that, that I've developed that's, that's called a serverless workflow. And what serverless is, is just like what it sounds is that you don't need any running server, just like in the case of the light bulb, the light bulb can can wait there and, and not do anything. So this is a you know, key, key concept here is there's nothing runs 24 seven. Uh, instead, you, you, it runs in response to an event. So uh, I have a database here that will store some records this will just be a uh, name of a company like Google, um, Amazon, something like that. And then I'll have a timer and this will be some interval that uh, I'll trigger a function and then I'll have something that's a producer function. And what this producer function will do is is it will read the data in response to this timer being triggered. So this timer triggers, this producer Lambda function reads the data from the database. The next thing that'll happen is it'll put this information into a, another resource in uh, AWS called SQS. And what SQS does is it stands for Simple Queuing Service so simple queuing service. And the simple queuing service uh, will push the another Lambda function. And this one we'll call the consumer. And this consumer can do all many different things. In this case, I'm gonna tell it to do some uh, sentiment analysis, so it'll do an NLP uh, API action using AWS Comprehend, and then it will, after it's done, it can put that information into object storage, or it can put that information into S3. So here we go. We can say um, persist that data. So persist. So what's what's great about this? is that this serverless uh, data engineering workflow all is, is gonna be triggered on demand versus having servers running every, every place. And it works a lot like the, the light bulb uh, based scenario. So let me show you a diagram of how something like this would work in practice. So, so I have a repo here called um, AWS Lambda, and this AWS Lambda project looks a little bit like this. So you have a, maybe I'll make this a little bit smaller. So you have the, the, the core component is I have a key value data store, and this key value data store uh, uh, it has all the information for companies that I want to do some kind of work, work, work on, and I can update this whenever I need to. I, maybe, maybe even there's another service that can update this with with the information that I need. This trigger happens in the, the example that I'm going to show. It'll only happen once a minute, but it could happen more frequently. Uh, or it could happen less frequently. Uh, typically, though. A, a job like this would probably be something like once a day. It grabs information and puts it into a queuing system. And this queuing system is really a, a way to 
to um, delegate event-based work. And what's nice about this is that you can put uh, really uh, a very high amount of volume into SQS. And SQS itself, uh, really, you can't break it. You can you can have an essentially unlimited stream of data into it. And on the other end of it, as soon as you put a message in, it'll automatically send this information to a consumer Lambda function. This will then go through and do a AI API call, do some sentiment analysis, and then put this into an S3 bucket. So this is a fairly generic architecture that many things could be swapped out, like uh, maybe instead of DynamoDB, this could live in originally just a file in S3, or it could come from a different kind of database, like a SQL query or something like that. Likewise, maybe if you don't want to queue it up, maybe you could um, send messages via SNS, and then those could directly call something. Uh, or if you don't want to do sentiment analysis, maybe you could do computer vision or some other kind of operation. But the, the ideas are that these are little pieces, and these pieces can be designed in any way that you want. So let me let me go through here and uh, go to AWS and start to build this out. So the first thing that uh, I would start with is let's just go into the Lambda console itself and, and just take a look at some of the things that are that are useful. So the first thing that I would recommend is that we can build a, a hello world type function. And the one I like to often do is build a, a, um, a Marco Polo function. So we'll say Marco Polo 718. <clears throat> You know, make this like this. And then for runtime, there's lots of different runtimes. Uh, I can pick Python 3.6. And one thing also to, to be aware of is that if you are gonna be talking to other components of the AWS ecosystem, you'll wanna have an execution role that, with permissions that does, let's say, permission to talk to a database. In this case, I'm, I'm not gonna to talk to anything. I'm just gonna make a, a hello world function. <clears throat> And, and this is always a good idea if you're using a new serverless arch architecture or a new system is maybe have like a simple function that you always build so that that you you can kind of test things out and, and get a, a baseline. So the, the core of a Lambda here, let me make this a little bit bigger. The core of a Lambda here is that it's got an, a, a function that does the work and this is the business logic and it accepts an event, which is this, and it returns back something. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to uh, make this ex accept uh, a, um, a name. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna look for if the event itself has a name parameter and the name is equal to Marco, then I'm gonna return back Polo. Otherwise, I'll return back no. And, and I'll even put a print statement so we can see that this is the event that's passed in. So say this is the event passed in like this. Okay, so here's the event. I'm gonna say um, save this. And, and then over here, you can configure a test event. So this is a good way to test Lambda functions. We'll, we'll go through here and we'll call this uh, Marco. And I can just remove all these values and say name, and then put in Polo like this, or, or I'm sorry, Marco. I forgot if I capitalized it or not, but uh, we'll find out. <laughs> okay, Marco format this, create it, and let's see, did I say, oh no, I said capital, so I need to change this. So I'm gonna go back here, change this to capital M, there we go. Okay, so if I, if I save this and I test it, you can see that it was able to return back the polo, so it came down here, printed this out, which we see that's the print statement, and then it said, if the name 
uh, as Marco, return back full. So it did. And if I want to go to a second event, what I can do is just change this and we'll call this one Bob and we'll go here and this one won't, won't will not return back Marco because it'll try to match and it won't match and it will go to the next one. So here we go. We can say this is the event passed in name Bob and, and, it, and it didn't work. So what what what, what, what really we see here is that this is a very clean way to build things uh, and and build very powerful things with high levels of concurrency. Let me show you a few of the key highlights of this system. One is that I can show I can see from this designer view everything I need to to hook this up to. So I could add a destination or I could add a trigger. So the destination is kind of interesting in that uh, I can actually send the results of this to um, an asynchronous invocation or a stream invocation. And the destination type here could be, I could put this into a, a SNS topic, which is really like a simple message, uh, SQS, Lambda or event bridge. So I can, I can also send this to other locations. And then in terms of the trigger, if I go to this trigger here, uh, I can select API Gateway, um, which is a web service. I can listen to IoT devices. I can listen to um, voice activation, smart home. I can also do things like uh, listen to source code commits, uh, a database, which, we, which is what we're going to do in a bit. Also uh, events, timers, streaming, S3 bucket. So there's, there's really a whole host of things that you can listen to. Uh, and that's what makes this very powerful, just like a light bulb, again, where you have all these different ways to trigger it. The other piece that's important as well is that you can set up environmental variables. So you could, you could basically have certain variables that you use for different environments for deployment, for example. Uh, and in terms of the basic settings here, uh, you can actually go through and change, let's say, the memory, right? If you want to have uh, you know, more memory allocated to your machine or you want to change the timeout. So typically the lambdas trigger very quickly, uh, but, it, but it's possible that you want to make it run uh, something that's a little bit more computationally expensive. And then also, as I mentioned before, you can actually uh, either create a new role or use an existing role that has elevated privileges so that it can talk to other parts of AWS. Uh, and then probably the only other thing that that's important in here that's from a high level is if we go to monitoring, uh, that you can uh, look at a visual here that shows you everything that's happening in, 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 a, in an overview and also look at uh, the logs as well. And the logs are a great way to debug things. And, and actually critical, it's really difficult to debug things without looking at the logs and if you go here, we should be able to see that, look, there we go. This is my event, Marco. This is the event, Bob. And it's important that you put print statements in so that you can see what it is that your Lambda function is actually doing. Okay, so that's really the hello world. Uh, and so if we want to build something slightly more complex, like if we want to go through and build this, um, what, how, what would we do it and how would we do it? Well, the, the first thing that I would, I would do in building something like this is, um, is, is go through and use a cloud-based development environment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back here and I'm going to use Cloud9. And let's, let's go into Cloud9. And this is, you can see it says a cloud IDE for writing, running code. And really the, the idea here uh, behind this cloud-based uh, environment is that it's, it's really the, the ideal scenario for, for building cloud-based microservices on AWS. So we'll go through here and uh, call this uh, serverless demo. And we'll go to the next step here. And this is a... Um, 
new micro a new ec2 instance a new virtual machine that it'll create and for students this is really a, a good option here is the free the free version and also i would leave all the defaults like amazon linux is a good default and also 30 minutes here you can see there's a 30 minute timer which saves us a lot of money makes it easy so it automatically goes to sleep uh, and you go through and you select create <coughs> This usually just takes a couple minutes. And once this is open, we can even import that Lambda that we created earlier and test it out. So that's one of the great things about this, this Lambda-based workflow into Cloud9 is that they work very well together and they're designed to work and integrate. And it, it, it's pretty likely that this service will get richer and richer and there'll be more and more features that are developed in, inside of it. That would be my, my hunch. So again, we'll just let this sit for a little bit. Um, it shall take just a second to, to wake up. And then once it wakes up, uh, I'll import the Lambda function inside of here. And this Lambda function, we can test it out inside of this, this environment. Okay, we'll let this wait a little bit longer. There we go. Okay, so now that this thing's awake, the main thing that you can do is if I go to this tab here, AWS resources, uh, I can look at all these remote functions. These are Lambda functions. And if I go to the one I just created, which was Marco Polo 718, and I right click on it, I can select import. And when I go to an import here, What's nice about this is that the same code is, is right here. So I can see the same thing I was working on, and that's helpful, uh, but I also can um, debug this code as well. So if I refresh this, and I go to this refresh icon, and I right click, I can say run, run local. And what this does is lets me locally test that same function. So I can do the same thing I was doing before. I can just type in, um, I can type in, uh, name and uh, Marco and let's go ahead and run this okay and let me do it one more time you have to it kinda, you have to warm it up the first time typically that you spin up an instance there we go so we see that the same things happening and if I do a different event John maybe there we go we'll, we'll run this okay right so so we see that this thing is is running we've got it all all wired up and what's also nice about this is if I wanted to I could toggle this and even call it inside of a web service locally or remotely or I also could call it in the cloud locally or remotely so it's a great uh really debugging tool and authoring tool for for serverless code and, and also what's nice about this is that this terminal here has access to lots of good tools like i can type in aws s3 and i could list buckets or i could list commands so really this has got all the things that i need to develop cloud-based tools so Pretty much we're, we're ready to go here. And so I'm gonna start building this, this service out here. So the first thing that I would do is let's make sure that the database itself uh, is working. So let me make, make a, a second version of this so that I can look at the source code example. Uh, so I'm going to uh, first go to DynamoDB and DynamoDB is really almost like a spreadsheet but a but a database spreadsheet and if i go to tables here you can see there's a dashboard tables uh, there's there's actually uh, a table that i created here that uh, i'm going to delete and you can see how easy it is to delete tables uh, and then if i want to create a new table it would just be like a demo put in some kind of globally unique id and and that's all that you need to do to create a, a database table and 
uh, it's it's fairly straightforward to then start adding things to it. And let's let's go to this table, which I created earlier, which we're gonna use. You can see I just put in a name as the globally unique ID, and I put the name of a company, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Netflix. Uh, and, and just to show you how easy this is, I can, I can delete something like this, or I can create something and I just add a string like Netflix like this, All right? So, so pretty, pretty straightforward process here to, to, to create things. Also, you can see it's pretty straightforward process to create new databases, um, uh, right? And the, here's my demo database. Again, I can app, add stuff to it, Apple, right? So it, it's a great resource the, to build services like this or to, to store anything and store any kind of key value pair. And it can automatically scale up as well. So you can actually tell it to um, be, have different capacities and automatically update and auto scaling and all kinds of great features here. Uh, but in this case, I'm going to go ahead and delete this table, this demo table that I created so you can see that. And I'm going to use this table called FANG, which stands for F Facebook uh, Amazon, Netflix, Google, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna build these companies in my pipeline, and I'm gonna do some research using automation. So I'm gonna go to these companies that are listed in here, web their web page, and grab their information from Wikipedia, and then and then uh, process it. So the, as I mentioned before, the first step here is create this database. If I look at the diagram, did that. And then now I, now I need to build this producer Lambda function. So what I can do is uh, go back to uh, Lambda here and let's just make sure that I don't have one called producer. I might have one already called producer. I'm gonna go to this and look at all my Lambdas. Do I have one called producer? Probably. Uh, I don't. Okay, so I can. I'm going to go ahead and, and make a lambda function called producer, but I'm going to make it in in this cloud environment. So how do I do that? So let's let's close this up here and let's go back to the resource. I can build it in either location, but I'm going to build it locally first here. I'm going to click on this icon. And it says create a new lambda function, and we'll call this producer. And it'll ask me some questions like. What about runtime? I'm gonna say Python 3.6, empty Python. And then for trigger, we don't need any of these triggers right now. I'm going to set up the trigger in the console. So I'm gonna go ahead and say next. And then for role, we will want to have higher privileges. So I'm gonna go for a, a role that I set up earlier that has higher permission privileges in this case. This is administrative privileges. Once this is set up, I'm gonna go ahead and say finish. Uh, oh, there we go. So we've got this producer, it's, it's ready to go. And then from here, um, the, it'll, it'll give me this empty template. So it's, so it's ready to go, ready for me to start writing code against it. So I'm gonna to go to some, some code I had earlier set up here, which should be the, um, producer code. I think it's in actually this this um, notebook here. So I'm going to go to this notebook and I'm going to throw in some some code that, that goes down here and shows me let's see here. Okay. Yeah, so this timed lambda. Yeah, so I want to basically grab this one. I want to grab this code here. Which is all it's going to do is, is essentially scan. I don't know why this is taking me a little bit of time to grab this, but Grab this, and then I'll, I'll walk through what this does. Okay, so we got that code. 
go to this, throw this in here. Okay, let's walk through what this code does. So the, the first thing that this does is that it makes a, uh, an instance to DynamoDB. It talks to the DynamoDB table that I showed earlier, uh, but it also will need to talk to a queue. So, okay, it looks like we need to set that up is this uh, queue called producer. So let's go back again to AWS and let's build out this um, queue here, just like this. And I'll go ahead and I'll say create queue. And, and in fact, let me just double check that there's no queue. So I do have one created called producer already. So I'm gonna delete, actually, I'm not gonna delete that. I'll just show, I'll make a different queue so you can see what it's like. We'll just call this like, hello. It's pretty simple. You can just literally just type in hello and then just say create queue. And, and it's, it's um, once, once the queue is created, if I wanna send and receive messages to it, we'll go back to the one I created earlier called producer, is I would just click on send and receive messages and I can literally put a hello message inside, send the message, and then what'll happen is if I pull for messages, it'll show up, right? And if I wanna send another message, like this is another message. I can send that in and then I get a second message, right? So, and if I stop polling and if I look at the message, right, you can just see it's it's pretty straightforward. It's just, it's, it's holding this information and, and this can take essentially an unlimited amount of traffic. So this is a very powerful mechanism to hold uh, messages. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, go back here and I'm going to say purge and what purge does is it just wipes out what's inside of the queue it doesn't delete the queue it just it it um, deletes everything that's inside of the queue so there we go and if I go back to send and receive messages and I see pull for messages there's nothing inside right so now that that's set up that's the other thing that I needed um, I can uh, go down here and you can see a couple important steps here as I add some logging and I have a, a logging library that's kind of irritating to set up uh, which is good for showing the details of, of installing software it's called Python JSON logger and what this line of code does is it uh, scans the DynamoDB database and, and retrieves information out of it and what this one does is it sends a message into SQS. Uh, and this is this would be grabbing the data that's in that queue and sending it to them. So this particular function, it says scan the table, get, get everything out of DynamoDB, and for every item inside, put a log and send that message uh, over to the queue. And then this entry point here, all this does is when the Lambda is triggered by AWS CloudWatch, what it will do is it'll scan that data and then send it to the queue, right? So what, what I often will do as well is, um, is, is, is uh, test this locally to make sure that it works properly before I deploy it into the cloud and hook up the trigger. So let's go ahead and, and do that. So let's look at the structure that's set up if you notice here that it, it created a producer uh, folder, inside of the producer folder, there's a producer subfolder, and there's also a virtual ENV here. So in this virtual environment, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make this smaller for a second, and I'm going to um, Stores. I'm going to CD into producer, and I'm going to source this virtual environment like that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to CD into the 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 directory below, right? Because it has a application directory and then it has a, a subdirectory. And what's a little bit weird about this is that in order to install the right packages, you, you have to do 
a, a little bit of a hoop jump. And uh, I think I have this listed here is that you have to run the pip install like this. You have to say dash dash target dot dot slash. And so why am I doing this? And I'll just show you here is that I'm putting the packages one directory above where I'm at. And, and this is the way that Lambda, when I install it, will know how to get its packages. So it's, it's a little bit goofy, but uh, it's the way that it currently works. I'm sure there'll be some improvement in the future. And you can see, look at, put all of those, they're, they're nested, they're nested right below that, that directory. And then the second one, would be the uh, Python JSON logging library, which is which is confusing because it is called Python hyphen JSON logger, even though when you use it, it's called Python JSON logger. So, not not a great uh, name and very confusing for people. But there you go, pip install it and install it one one directory above. Okay, great. So now that I've got that, uh, I can actually test this locally. Uh, before I deploy it. So I'm going to click on this icon again, right? It toggles this. And in the producer icon here, if I right click on it, I can actually run it. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to go ahead and run this uh, Lambda function here and do it uh, remote. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, run, I'm sorry, run local. When I run local, I don't have to even put a payload in here because it, it doesn't accept anything. This Lambda just runs. So I'm going to go ahead and say run. And what it'll do is that it will actually scan the table and send all these messages to the queue. So how would I know this is working? Well, one, we can see the log messages here, right? I can see sending name Netflix. And if I go back to SQS, and if I say pull for messages, these messages should populate. And they do. There you go. And I can look in each one. And we can see the the name is Microsoft, right? If I look at another one, we can look at the name is Netflix, right? So we have we have this nice queue set up here that's putting the messages inside. So it looks like this thing's working. And I'm ready to then deploy it. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, right click on this and go to deploy. There we go. Give this just a second. Okay, so now that this is ready to deploy, uh, I'm or, or or it has deployed, I'm going to go back to AWS and open up one more tab here, and I'm going to go to Lambda, and what we should see is this producer was deployed, and you can see it was deployed 19 seconds ago. So that's one great resource with this Cloud9 environment is it has a hook. Where it, can, where it can easily put this uh, working code inside of the um, AWS LAN console. So great. So what do I need to do in order to get this running according to this diagram? So remember, we, we got that set up. We set up that. We just made this function, tested it, but we want to trigger it. So we want this thing to run periodically uh, by itself, right? So we want it to be autonomous. Uh, so how do I do that? I'm going to set up a CloudWatch timer and I can do that by going back to the designer and adding a trigger and in this case I'm going to say add trigger and I'm going to say select trigger and I'm going to do a um, uh, let's see here event bridge which is an, uh, a time a time here and I can either create a new rule or use an existing rule and um, I've created many different timers in the past here. So I'm just going <clears> to <throat> use one of them. <clears throat> and this one, you can see the way it works is you have a rate. And this one, this rate is going to be 
one minute. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and say add. And now this should be fairly instantaneous. And how can we know it's working? Well, one of the ways that we would know it's working is you could look down here and you could just look at the description, see what it's doing, and even look at that event in CloudWatch. Also, double check that this is enabled. If this is enabled, then the it's this is being triggered. The other thing we can do is look at the queue because we know that this would, should be making the number go higher and higher every minute automatically because we haven't run this thing again. So if I look at the poll for messages here, this thing should start to populate uh, and get get higher uh, after some interval, right? So this should just get um, bigger and bigger. Uh, and there we go. Now we've got eight messages for messages right so it, it'll just as as I as I sit here uh, I can a intercept it and in fact it even tells you what, what's neat about this is it even tells you the number uh, of, of of unique messages that it's, that it's actually received so it's received in this case three of the same message uh, and and it, and it shows you the count as well so we can we can look through here. Look, and it says now it's twelve. So it's it's incrementally adding uh, messages inside of here. So we we know that this part is working. So we've got the first part of this pipeline. We got the timer. We got the database set up. We got the lambda reading from the database. It's putting things in. So we're ready for the the next phase of our serverless data engineering pipeline, which is okay. We need to read the information out, do something, and, and in this case, we're going to do sentiment analysis. So I'm going to show you briefly here, the um, sentiment analysis page. It's called Comprehend. In this place, I'm gonna go to Amazon Comprehend right here. And there we go. Let's go ahead and say um, some kind of a message like, in fact, I can even go to Wikipedia here and we can just type in Google like this and I can just put some kind of information from Google inside so there we go we'll paste this in and like that we'll analyze it Google was founded blah 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 right these are all entities that are extracted and it's able to identify those entities with a certain uh, confidence here we go Next up, I can look at key phrases. There we go, here's key phrases. We can look at language. Uh, we can look at sentiment, syntax. These are all different different things that I can, I can do here. Uh, and so I'm gonna hook up some of those smarts into this system. And so let's go ahead and uh, go to this. And I'm going to, um, Build, build again. Build a second, a second lambda function. So, how do I do that? Uh, I will go to um, this section here and click again, create a new lambda function, and this one will call uh, consumer and, and I'll just put today's date, seven eighteen, and this will consume everything that's in the queue. So, I'm going to go again to Python three six, go to an empty Python function, for function trigger, we'll say none automatic generate role no we're going to choose an existing administrative role say next here and then go to finish here we go this looks like it's ready and uh, next up uh, what i can do is uh, go over to this uh, producer producer uh, function here and and uh, know that this is the one that's producing it, but I'm going to, when I'm done, make one that's a, that's a consumer right here. So <clears throat> we can see it here is the consumer function. I'm gonna go to the same uh, dialog box here or into the source control. 
and I'm gonna go to the consumer message here and let me just make sure this is the right one. No, I think I have um, Wikipedia sentiment. And so what this code does, and, and maybe this is a good spot to read from, is that I import the pandas library. I also import Wikipedia. I import Boto3. And then I add some logging. And these are all little bits of code that I, that I use. I have a function that makes names uh, appear in or grabs the names from Wikipedia using this library called Wikipedia, which is this one right here. And I'll show you how that works in, in a second. Uh, and then I also have um, a uh, sentiment library here that can run sentiment analysis by doing uh, detect sentiment. And then I apply the sentiment analysis to this pandas data frame and then finally, when I'm done, uh, I write this information down to, to this uh, data frame. So let's go ahead and, um, and do that. So I'll, I'll, I'll grab the full one, which is, <clears throat> let's see here. This would be the serverless sentiment analysis. I think it's this one. Yeah, this is the one here. Okay, so I'm going to go to raw and, and paste this into my... Uh, function here. So if I save this out, you can see all of this in here. Next up, what I can do is again, I look at this virtual environment, I'm going to deactivate this one, because I want to be I'm in a, I'm in a second um, Lambda function. And I'm going to CD into this consumer 718. And I'm going to source the virtual environment. So that's usually the first step when you when you build one of these things is is um, to to source this virtual environment that lets you install packages and work with packages in, in, inside of here. So uh, what's what's nice about this is that once I've got this set up, uh, I can I can start to install packages, play around with packages, and and even I could another trick that you can do is you can also put the packages inside of this requirements file here. So if I if I look at this, this is the consumer, uh, I could put the, the packages I need in here. So I could say Python, JSON, logger, I could say pandas. Uh, and I could also put in Wikipedia. And I think that those are the core things that I need. I'm going to close the rest of these here. So if I go back up here, I see I need Bodo, Pandas, Wikipedia. That looks like that's what I got. So, oh, I didn't put Bodo in here. So we'll say Bodo 3, Bodo 3. Looks like I've got everything I need. So to, so what, what I, a couple different things I can do here. If I want, I could also use, let's say, IPython if I want to debug something and, and use, a, use a terminal to play around, and I'll show you that in a second. So I'm, I'm going to uh, do a um, pip install of this. So I'll say pip install dash r requirements dot txt. And th what this is going to do is um, in my virtual environment, it's going to get everything installed. And, and what's nice about this is I could play around a little bit with some of the code to just make sure it works before I build this really complex Lambda function. A lot of times when you when you start to get to a Lambda that's this big, this isn't huge, but it's got a, a total of, let's say, 170 lines of code. It's easy to make mistakes. And so what what's not a bad idea is to maybe take little key parts of it and, and, and actually experiment and make sure that you understand how it works. So what I'll do is I'll run IPython, which is an interactive interpreter. And I can just do, do small pieces of the project. So maybe one of the things I want to look at is this Wikipedia library. So I'm going to do that. <clears throat> so I'm going to, I'm going to say import Wikipedia. And then what does this Wikipedia library do? Well, it just grabs a Wikipedia page. And I think I have an example of this. 
So we can see um, wikipedia.summary. So I'm going to say uh, wikipedia, and we'll say this is the result, wikipedia.summary. And if I put in, let's say, Google and sentences, this should grab one sentence from the Wikipedia page from Google. And if I say result, there we go. And if I change it to something else, we'll say um, Amazon. There we go. And if I want to change it to a bigger sentence, I can change four. There we go. Right. So so this is pretty useful and I can and I can do that to to, to all other pieces of code in here and just kind of step by step, you know, walk through if I was curious about it. Or, or here's another one, the um, sentiment API, the um, uh, sentiment analysis. So let's get, let's, let's actually try that one out. So if I say import <clears throat> Boto3, I can make an instance of this like that, comprehend. And then I can actually get the payload. And, and put that into a result as well. So I can say here. And I think it was result is what I what I called it. And if I type in payload, you can see what it what it gives me back, which is that this is neutral sentiment, which because it's a an article, it should be neutral. <clears throat> so great, I'm able to actually figure that out. <clears throat> what if I want to do a different kind of API call <clears throat> in the future? Like, for example, maybe I want to do a the entity extraction. Well, I can look at the um, Boto three docs. In the documentation, I can find the service that I want to use. So let's say this is Comprehend, which is the natural language processing library. Here we go, AWS Comprehend. And I can, you can see that I can do um, sentiment, which is right. Uh, let's see, detect sentiment, but I also can detect key phrases or also I can detect entities. Let's let's maybe try um, the uh, the key phrases here. So let's go back to my environment and let's just change this to key phrases. So I can just again play with this. I can just say detect key phrases and it'll tab complete payload. There we go. And, and I can scroll, look, and you can see, look, it, it's able to grab key phrases out of here, right? So lots of great um, debugging can be done interactively like this. So this is typically what I do. So, okay, I got the majority of this working here. Uh, looks like I'm good to go. So, so next up, I'll do that same trick that I did before, which is I, I again have to install the packages one directory above and I could look at my history. This is a good trick to know about. If you type in history, you can find where I did that, that installation. So I'm going to go ahead and do, do something similar again, but I'm going to do it slightly different now because what I can do is I can say, um, Python pip, pip three, Python install dash R and then say the requirements file, which I believe is right here. Yeah, right here. Uh, and that's the way that I'll do the, the installation. Now, before I do that though, I'm gonna put a, a hashtag to just save that command, is I need to CD one, one layer in, right? Because I have to install the packages. Um, I have to go into the directory and then install the packages above where I'm at. So I'm going to go into consumer here, and then I'm going to do that command. So I can just do the up arrow, 
and see how the hashtag is there, I can I can type in control A, it brings me to the end of the line, control E goes to the end, control A goes to the beginning. I can take this out and then do control E again and run it. And this is going to install this again one one directory above here. If I do this like that, there you go. Pip3 install, user requirements file, install everything up one level up. Oh, because I need to, the, the requirements file is also up one directory. So we'll say dot dot slash like that. There we go. Perfect. Okay, so it's putting those packages one, one directory up here. That's pretty funny that it, that it, that it uh, kicked me out, uh, which is strange that it would kick me out of here, but I'm going to log back in again. <clears throat> and I'm going to do my auth code. Here we go. And we'll type this in. So I'm re re reconnecting here. <clears throat> not sure why that kicked me out. That that happens occasionally, not that often though. Okay, so it looks like everything installed correctly, and we can see that because w this directory here, this um, consumer it has all these packages right here so pretty much this looks ready to go and let me just walk through the code one more time to just make sure that uh, it's understood so the first thing that happens here is that i uh, import these libraries including json um, bodo wikipedia i set up some logging that goes right here and then uh, i have some code here that mostly is just uh, logging code. In fact, maybe I just can uh, clean this up if I needed to, but it, it shows you that I'm going to parse this queue information here. And then I'm making a connection to the queue. This is actually not necessary, this approximate count queue, but uh, it, it, it can tell me how many messages in the queue if I wanted to change it. This is a an important one though is uh, the deleting the messages from the queue. When you're interacting with uh, SQS, you have to delete the messages after you process them or they'll stay in there forever. So that's what this does is you pass in the name of the queue and you pass in the message and then it'll delete the message for you. <clears throat> this is the, the line of code that <clears throat> will go through and return the Wikipedia pages and it'll make it into a, a data frame. This next section is the sentiment analysis that we went over. This will go through and, and score it. And then this function just applies the create sentiment analysis into a data frame. And then this, this section here just writes data to S3. So again, I could test this out if I wanted to tweak this a little bit and, and change it. Uh, but this is writing to an S3 bucket. And then this is the Lambda handler. This one's a little bit bigger than the um, producer Lambda in that it does more work. So what's, what's important here is that this event is actually the queue event. So this Lambda is called every time the queue has a message into it, this is gonna be put into as a trigger and it will parse the receipt parse the source and then basically say for every record it finds load it into this variable grab the company name out of it and then go through and append this so that i can start processing the messages in the queue afterwards go ahead and delete the messages and then go through here and make a pandas data frame perform sentiment analysis and then write those results to S3, right? So we've got this whole um, uh, record here, process of the events and, and put them into S3. So perfect, we got all that working, that looks good. 
Uh, now, now that I've got that working, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go again to this tab here and I'm going to go to the consumer and I'm going to right click on it. And let's go again back here. So consumer, right click, and I'm going to say deploy. And it'll take a little bit, it'll maybe take like 30 seconds or so to deploy this. And while that's deploying, let's go to SQS and this number should be way higher right here. So I'm going to go ahead and reload this. And um, the, 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 the messages, you can see it's huge, right? Look, there's 84 messages inside of here. So it's, it's basically been just adding more and more messages to the queue. It's getting very full. So how do I process those? Well, we need to get our, our serverless Lambda processing those messages in the queue. So what I'm going to do is um, go back to this console here and hopefully this will be deployed looks like it's been deployed 15 seconds ago we'll go to this consumer uh, and it looks like it's ready to go here notice that when you put a large function in here they'll disable the inline coding so all i need to do to get this working is click on add trigger and the trigger will be the queue so I can scroll down to the queue, which will be SQS. Uh, now, notice as well that, that there's all kinds of other event sources that people are using, like a, um, these, are, these are a bunch of other uh, types of, of uh, integrations from third-party services. But in this case, I'm gonna go to SQS like this and I'm gonna choose SQS queue. In this case, um, the queue will be the producer queue. And I can also choose how many messages at a time I wanna receive. Maybe I just wanna receive one message at a time. And then this will go through and enable the trigger. So this is, in reality, should instantaneously start draining the messages in the queue, just like processing them very, very quickly because it's completely async. So if I go back to the queue now, and I refresh, this should be, this should drain very quickly. So it's got 92. Let's just keep refreshing here. And let's see how quickly that this thing can work. <clears throat> it may take a second to, to spin this thing up. Let's see here. Um, Send and receive messages. And, and one of the, I guess while, while I'm waiting for this thing to get, because I think it takes a second actually to, uh, we should we can check, look, see it's still creating. So it's not, it hasn't yet populated. They, they have to do some behind the scenes configuration, but as soon as this is wired up, it should asynchronously process every single message in, in the queue. So let's let's wait for this. And we'll refresh this thing. And it looks like the the queue the queue is now set up. Yeah, so there you go, it's enabled. So if I go back here and we refresh this, how quickly does it empty the queue? Wow, instantaneous. It's because it's and this is what's very important to know about this is that you can write massively parallel code this way because the queue every single message is processed in 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 real time um, asynchronously so now that we've got that 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 working how do I test it out well if I go back to my function there's a couple different ways we can look at this but one is if I go back to my um, function you can see that it puts the information into this bucket so I can go to the um, S3 location. Let's reload this. Go to S3 and find that bucket called Fang Sentiment. And we can do this. Fang Sentiment. And look, you can see if I toggle by last modified this is today's date look amazon microsoft google netflix these are all sentiment analysis so let's just grab 
maybe this one. I'm going to download it. And I will, in fact, pull this into our Cloud9 environment because you can you can upload things in here. And I'm going to I'm going to upload it in here. So we'll say Amazon sentiment analysis. And where is this? There we go. So if I double click on it, you can see that it was able to process that information and, and give a record that shows the sentiment analysis for the Wikipedia page would be neutral. So this could be, let's say, a PR firm maybe wants to periodically make sure that their Wikipedia page doesn't have you know, nasty things uh, about them set up. So we got that working. Uh, that's, that's great. So next up here is that um, we can we can go through and also look at the instrumentation of the service. So uh, let's go to monitoring here. And if we look at this, you can see that um, it should be able to show us all of the successful invocations of the consumer. Eventually this will start populating. Another way though is I can look at the logs. This is probably one of the best ways to debug an existing system is to uh, go through and um, look at the log files and, and see what it's doing. Look, we can see the timestamp here and you, you'll see in here that there'll be a bunch of information about what we're, what we're building and, and we can see exactly every single event. So if I, if I wanted to type in Netflix, for example, this should give me something. There we go. So we can see that in this case, look, I'm, I'm deleting records. I'm doing all kinds of stuff. Like I'm processing a data frame and I can just kind of step through the code line by line, see where it talks to Wikipedia, see where I do sentiment analysis from fang companies, all kinds of stuff inside of here. So this is uh, pretty much ready to go in terms of a, a production system that could run forever. And as I mentioned before, this is just one variation. I could al always swap these pieces out and make them do slightly different things. So one thing I will mention though, is it's important to clean up after what you did or else you'll get yourself in big trouble. So I'm gonna go ahead and close that um, Cloud9 environment here. And in fact, I could even Dub, you know, click on this icon here and delete it. We'll just say um, delete here. Then the other thing that I'm going to need to do is I'm going to need to go to the um, the queue and uh, I'm going to need to uh, actually delete this queue. So let's go ahead and delete this queue and we'll type in delete like this. And then I also would need to go to the lambdas and make sure that they're deleted. Because if we don't want to be having a, a timer that's running constantly giving us a bill, essentially. So I'm going to delete this one. And then I'll delete this other one as well. So whenever you're building something like this, especially one that's running on a timer like that, uh, and maybe even delete the one I just created, is good to clean up. So. That's that's the AWS uh, serverless architecture. Now let's let's we have a little bit of time here. Let's get into can't we do the same thing with uh, another cloud? Well, they do have the same thing with the Google Cloud. So if I go to GCP and I go to the GCP console, we can do something very similar. They have something called Cloud Functions, and let's walk through how you would do that. So if I type in uh, Cloud Functions here functions. Here we go, cloud functions. <clears throat> uh, you can see I have a bunch of test functions here, but let's make another one here and we'll call this um, maybe like hello, uh, hello 718. And look, the, they have the same concept. So the same concept is how do I want to trigger this? Do I want to trigger this as a web service? Do I want to trigger this as a messaging service, uh, like a pub sub service, very similar to what we just built, cloud storage, Firestore, 
which is a key value database, Google Analytics, um, authentication, a real-time database. So I, I have a bunch of different options here. We're, we're going to go ahead and just stay with uh, HTTP. And then how do I want to work with this? I can do an inline editor. I can upload things. I can integrate with a cloud environment. Uh, and then also, what's the runtime? You can see I've got Go, Python. Um, so let's go to Python 3.8. Let's have some fun here. And inside of here, uh, what this what this shows us is that this will respond to any kind of a message. And so uh, we can actually take this out because it's it's annoying how much um, how much logging is inside of here. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this. Right. So do this. Uh, hello. Uh, and then the next thing that I can do here. I don't know why this is um, giving me these weird messages. Maybe because it's beta. Uh, but basically, what I can do is is um, look at this request and 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 uh, do something with it. So I think I can actually uh, say here request JSON. Uh, I can actually just say request.json, maybe just prints. We'll, we'll just say print request.json to start with and just test that out. Whoops, don't want to cancel this. Okay, and we'll go ahead and create this. All right. And they actually have a pretty nice system here where I can test this by going to testing. And once it's available, it'll it'll give me uh, the ability to just put a message in, say like name hello. And I can and I can test this function when it's finished de deploying. It's, it takes just a second to to actually deploy it. Let's go ahead and do this. Just save this and um, copy. You also can see that it'll tell you the trigger type shows you the source code again, which is what we just changed. You can you, you can actually add packages here, which is pretty neat, uh, which is maybe an improvement over the way that we do it in, in AWS Lambda. And then also I could add permissions as well. I could add additional services. Okay, but okay, let's go here, through here. Let's test this function. And it says, uh, somehow I screwed it up uh, by, by doing this this way. Um, so I'll, I'll just show you an, another one that I did earlier that uh, let's let's look at this one. This one probably works. Let's see. Source code. So I think all I do here is I can just put a message. Let's just say message. Hello. And it should work the same way. Let's us let's us test test out our code. There we go. Output is hello. So this I, I should have just uh, left the left the code the way it is. Basically, it, it I'm parsing JSON here. So this is just a really simple one. But let's look at a slightly more complex one that's similar. So I have one here that uh, allows you to translate uh, messages. And so what do I do? Is I use that same Wikipedia library. But now I take advantage of Google Cloud's uh, translation API. And so what I do is I, I take some text. This is the text to translate. I take some project information. And then I um, select a language inside of here. So this one in particular, uh, what, it, what it does is this is just a, a, a function that can translate. 
and then this is the actual payload, this translation text here, it, and this even tells you the, the function to execute translate text is, so get the JSON payload. If I know, if I find the word entity, grab that out, grab the language out, and then grab the sentences out uh, inside, and then uh, do the translation on it. So the first, uh, I have the Wikipedia summary of the entity here, which is that that a field. Then I pass in the um, a project ID here, and then I also go through here and I uh, select the language. So I can I can put in entity language and sentences, and it will find the Wikipedia page for a company use a specific language and then um, return back a translated version of some some amount of sentences that i that i decide so we can test this this is a, a pretty neat function here that's pretty useful so if i go to testing i can pass this in go like this and um, just just essentially make sure I remember to put these in. So I've got entity is one. We've got language is another. And then we've got sentences. There we go. So how about for entity? We'll say again, um, Google. And then for languages I actually like the double quotes better this is kind of irritating with the single quote let's just do a double quote so we got link entity is going to be Google and then we've got language will be um, French FR and then for sentences Let's go through here and let's put in, uh, let's see, maybe like 10 sentences or something like that. There we go. And if I test this, if I got this correctly, it should go to Google's Wikipedia page in English and then translate it to French. There we go. So I'm able to translate this to, to French. And I could even look at the, um, the API here that they have available and um, find the languages that are, and, and find the language codes. Uh, so for example, I think ES is Spanish, but, but let's, let's see if I translate this. Yeah, there you go. Uh, El Rapido. Uh, um, and I could just keep keep going in. I think is this uh, simplified Chinese? I think maybe. A anyway, I could I could I could go through here and, and play around with whatever language I want um, by looking up the language codes uh, and, and and translating them. So these these serverless functions here are very very useful uh, and. Uh, a great way to to build things very very quickly, and now and you know knowing this in fact works. Another thing you can do is that you could deploy this as a web service as well, uh, and then and then call this thing uh, from an from a web based API. So for example, this particular API endpoint, if I wanted to, um, I could actually start making API calls against it. Uh, and and use let's say a curl command to 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 actually call this, uh, and and it's a very straightforward way to actually build build services. Uh, and just I guess in summary here, these uh, Google Cloud functions, uh, Azure Cloud functions, um, AWS Cloud functions are are one of the most powerful ways now to build code and it takes things that took really a long time to build uh, and, and dramatically simplifies the operation. I think that's the main uh, takeaway of this.
So maybe this is a good spot to to stop uh, sharing for a second and then ask if anybody has any questions about what we went over. Uh, the, the source code itself, uh,